with us this morning, especially those of you who may be visiting. And if you are, we hope you'll come back and worship with Jackson United Methodist again. If you would please note the announcements coming up for the week ahead. First of all, um, we are done with the Wednesday activities for this year, and so there will be no Wednesday activities uh, until the 12th of January, so please take note of that. Also note that uh, this Friday evening, Christmas Eve, we will have two services here at the church. The first one will be at 5 p.m. in the fellowship hall. That will be the contemporary service. And then the traditional Christmas Eve candlelight service here in the sanctuary at 7 p.m. And that will be on Friday. Also please note that uh, the following two Sundays after this one, we will only have one worship service. That will be on the 26th of December and the 2nd of January. And that will be... 10 o'clock in the morning here in the sanctuary. So please note these and all other announcements as they pertain to you. And now the hour has arrived when all who worship the Father shall seek him in spirit and in truth, for he seeks such to worship him. Let us give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name as our choir leads with the call to worship.
Here's a reading from Luke 1, 26 through 38. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, But how can this happen? I am a virgin. The angel replied, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was buried. But she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month, for the word of God will never fail. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. Let us prepare room in our hearts for him. Even so, Lord Jesus, come. Let's pray. As you come in the stillness of night, Great God, enter our lives this morning. Overcome darkness with the light of Christ's presence, so that we may clearly see the way to walk, the truth to speak, and the life to live for Him, our Lord Jesus Christ. We have an opportunity to pray together. Um, how many of you grew up uh, singing hymns? Okay, I, I, I did not. So I, I've said that I, I did not grow up in a traditional church setting. And so sometimes when we sing hymns, um, the words I, really speak to me. Um, and maybe that's in a way that you've heard before, um, and so sometimes I just make observations. Uh, that last hymn that we sang, In That Holy, In That Lowly, um, there's a part of the, the last that we sing, it says, thus rejoicing, free from sorrow, praise his voicing, greet the morrow, and then the phrase, Christ the babe was born for you. Um, how many of you hear that, Christ the babe was born for you? How many of you hear that as a positive acclamation of what God has done in your life. Just curious. This is how my mind works. Um, and I, I think when you hear that, that's what allows us to 
express our thanks to God, right? That's what creates our thankfulness of uh, encouraging us to, to be generous and to encourage us to give of the blessings that God gives us is to recognize that that phrase, I mean, Christ the babe was born for me. Um, that's amazing. But then there's also the other part of that as we sang it. I wondered how many of you hear that as a um, statement of mission that Christ the babe is a message. It's not just a message that Christ was born for me. It's a message that I can take to the world and say Christ the babe was born for you. So how many of you hear it or have ever heard it that way, that it's a message for the church? Interesting. It's, it, it, so I would just encourage you to think about it because it's twofold. It's a message for us, but it's also a mission for us in the church, for us to go out and share the good news of great joy for all people, right? That Christ the babe was born for you. And so it gives us the opportunity to be mindful uh, as a church. And, and so when I heard that this morning as we sang it, and that message kind of spoke to me both beautiful, I thought, we're going to change up how we normally pray today because here's what I know. Christmas Eve is Friday, and it is singularly the, the day that most people who are not part of the church, they are more receptive to an invitation to come to church on Christmas Eve than any other day in the, in the whole entire year. Uh, Easter is a close second, but Christmas Eve is the greatest day. So you have cards. I was going to do this at the beginning. You have cards on your seat. They're not for you to just look at. Uh, they are for you to take home with you. Uh, and they're not for you to put on your refrigerator. How many of you are at some point in time this week, when you leave church today, you're going to at least go out one time before Christmas Eve? So you're not going home and hibernating through Friday, right? So everybody is probably going to take this card and give it to somebody. Invite them to Christmas Eve. If you're going to the grocery store, hand it to your clerk. I don't care if the clerk has a stack of them. Y'all keep handing them to them because God is telling us to invite that clerk. Uh, so go and invite somebody. It's in your doctor's office. It's your family. It's your neighbor because they're more receptive on Christmas Eve. So here's what we're going to do. I want you to look around the room and see that there are plenty of spaces available, right? And so I want you to picture somebody. You don't have to even know their name or their face. But we're going to pray for the people who aren't here. Um, we're going to pray for God to move in us, his people, to go out and share this message that we know, which is that Christ the babe was born for them. And so at the end, I'll invite you to say the Lord's Prayer with me. But I want you to pray for the people who are yet to come. Okay? Let's pray. Most gracious God, we come in this moment and we give you thanks that you did come for us and that that is good news and it is great joy. But Lord, we know that there are many people who today, this week, they, they don't know your joy. They don't know you. Or maybe they've known you and they've drifted away. Whatever the reason, they need more of you in their life. And so God, in this moment, we, your people, come together and we cry out for you to move in the hearts of us to encourage us to hand these cards out, to invite the people that you want to be in this place. Help us, God, to think about these empty spaces, not as empty, but as waiting for you to bring people in and so, Lord, move in their hearts today, right now, even though they may not be in this place, move in their hearts so that they are open to this invitation that is coming towards them. Because it's good news for them, just like it's good news for us. And so, God, we don't pray for this place to fill up just so that we feel good. We pray for this place to be full because we know that you are God who brings good news for everyone. Salvation, wholeness, eternal life. It's the greatest gift. I invite you to know the Lord's Prayer to join me as we unite our hearts 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Bibles turn to uh, 1 John 
chapter 4, and then I'm going to encourage you just to leave your Bibles open as we refer back and forth in this passage uh, most of the morning. Uh, 1 John chapter 4, I'm going to read to you verses 9 through 12, starting in verse 9. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Christmas, six days away. Uh, and so that creates a little bit, I assume, uh, chaos, uh, anxiety to some. Uh, maybe it brings peace uh, to, to others. How many of you are completely done with all of your Christmas shopping? Raise your hand. Few of you are. I literally had to wait to see if my wife's hand got raised at the last service because I don't know. Uh, uh, she is she she takes that responsibility, and so I literally didn't know if we were done or not. But apparently we are, uh, and so that's good. Uh, they tell us that about. 40 to 45 percent of the people still have Christmas shopping to do. Um, any of you wait to start? Have you had, not even started yet? Anybody be willing to be brave and say that? My aunt, she'll she'll kill me for saying this. My aunt Linda, she is one who is notorious. She does all of her Christmas shopping on Christmas Eve. Uh, she waits until Christmas Eve to do everything, uh, and so. Um, that's just different people have different things, right? And that we, some people uh, really stay with the list. How many of you are list people? So if somebody gives you a list, you try to get the gift off of the list. Okay, so you're a list person. Anybody else? How many of you else would say you're more creative? So you're like, okay, I'll, I will just try to figure out what's the best gift. You're going to be the creative one, Bert. Okay, excellent. Um, my, my mother, I see how well y'all would do this for your list people. I'm a list person, so if you give me a list, because I like to shop, go in and out. And so I don't want to be one of those that's looking all around for different things. Um, my mother, you know, one year for Christmas, she told us what she wanted in her list was she wanted manure. Uh, she had a new garden thing she was doing, and so she wanted some manure for her Christmas gift, and I refused. Uh, I was like, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a list person, but that's kind of where I draw the line um, of the fact that I'm not going to give manure for Christmas. But, um, but you know, we, we all have different ways of thinking about our gift selection, um, and then also kind of the way that we receive gifts. Um, it's a very interesting dynamic when you give your gifts and receive gifts, because sometimes you get gifts that are questionable at best, right? And so, have you ever gotten a gift where you're like, you don't really know what it is, and yet you still have to kind of respond in a way that is not offensive, right? So you're like, that's interesting. Uh, how many of you have ever got one of those? You people, okay. So my most eccentric gift giver uh, was my Aunt Louise. Uh, she would always give the strangest gifts. And uh, one year I remember, I was not a little boy, but I, I was not a teenager. So I'm going to guess I was somewhere probably 10 or 11. Uh, I opened up the gift from her, and it was these wood blocks that were in the shape of different animals. Um, and so we knew her, and we knew that she's kind of a, an interesting person. And so we were like, okay, there's something more to these, but we had to figure out what it was. And so our, we realized that it was a puzzle. And so we sat down for hours in the living room floor to put this puzzle together. There was only a few pieces, so you would think the puzzle would be fairly easy to do. Uh, so probably two hours went by, eventually my mother talked to my aunt and told her how much I appreciated that I had been playing with it all day long. Um, and so she asked her, how, you know, how did it work? And she was like, well, they're just wood blocks. I mean, they're, 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 I just thought they were nice that you would look at them. And so there was no puzzle to them whatsoever. Um, we had just sat for two hours trying to figure this out. Um, she just gave the strangest things. Um, but my most unique gift, uh, by far, um, was one year my grandmother, she uh, gave all of the grandchildren the same gift. So it, 
if the first one opened up, you knew what you were getting. So the first grandchild opened up the gift, and it was a sweater, a beautiful sweater. And so we all knew we were getting sweaters, and so sweater, sweater, sweater. Came time for me to open up mine, and I opened up my gift, and it was a um, big jar of peanut butter. And then every grandchild below was sweater, 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 sweater. And now I love peanut butter, but I'm like, well, what's, at least it was creamy. So that was good. Um, but I, I never, and my grandmother, she passed away a couple of years ago, and I, I never asked her why. I was in college, and I got a jar of peanut butter. And everybody in the family, it was such an awkward moment because nobody knew what to say. And, and so we just went on to the next one. Um, and so I never got to ask why uh, that was what she gave me that year, but she gave me a jar of peanut butter. So, uh, but what do you say in those moments? And um, those really don't have anything to do with the sermon other than just simply, um, you know, I think sometimes as people of faith, we, we do sometimes struggle with, like, how do we, how do we live out this faith? How, how do we as followers of Christ um, live faithful to Jesus? And, and so I tie that in with, like, you know, what would Jesus want from us for Christmas? Like, we think about the gift that, gives, that Jesus gives us, but what would Jesus, what would Jesus desire out of us? And I just want to share a passage. You can say with First John, but I want to go back real quick to Matthew 25 because I think I think Scripture is very clear what Jesus would want from us. Listen to what it says in Matthew 25. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Jesus makes it very clear that our relationship with God is not separate from our relationship with other people. That's the reason that, like, Angel Tree is so important, because it helps us to not disconnect the love of God to the love of other people. And so my hope is that if I had a prayer for you this week of Christmas is that Christmas is not a day. Christmas isn't just an event that comes. Christmas is, um, it's every day. It's an invitation to live out the gospel message every day of your life. To be able to go out and to proclaim that message that Christ the babe is born for you. So would you pray with me? Almighty God, we give you praise for the hope that this season brings, for the, the excitement, the anticipation. We also pray, Lord, that you help us You say in your word. It's in the name of the resurrected Christ we pray. Amen. So I want to read back to you this passage that we read in 1 John, because I think John probably elaborates better than any of the other gospel writers on this connection between the love of God and the love of other people. But it says this again, it says, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. So right off the bat, John says, this is how God shows his love, by sending his love into the world so that we can live through him. So Christmas, the birth of Christ, what we have been celebrating as Advent or anticipating for Advent, what we're going to celebrate on Friday night, the birth of Christ is literally an expression of God's love. That's what scripture tells us. God reveals himself to us by taking his love and turning it into flesh, bones. Blood, skin. That's how he reveals himself. God doesn't demonstrate his love to us by a bunch of empty words. It's by a very tangible, practical application. A very act of love and service. And then in verse 11, it says this to the church. This is how we are to love one another. So it's not just through words. It's not through empty words or, or action words. It's through the literal service of of loving one another. 
So in other words, our, our service to other people should have skin on it. It should cost us something. And that's a pretty simple message. And I think that it's one that most of us have probably heard before. I've preached it before. And I'll preach it again. Because it's in the execution of it that we struggle with. And so I want us to think about that. How, how do we mess that up? Such a simple thing. But how do we mess it up? One, I would say to you is that our love and commitment to Jesus sometimes fails to produce the tangible acts of love and service to our neighbor. In other words, our, our faith becomes solely about belief and it doesn't move into an act of love and service. I mean, salvation is a, it's, it's a, it's an interesting concept, but it's more than just simply words, right? I mean, there's a, there's an action that goes with it on behalf of God and on behalf of us. So you think about it, it's like, how do we, how do we keep Christ at the center of this season? Because there's a lot of chaos and the, and the, the world bombards us. How do we keep Christ at the center? And I know there's going to be somebody in here that's going to say something to me afterwards about this, but the, um, so a lot of times what you'll hear Christmas season is you'll hear people say, well, we need to say Merry Christmas. So if somebody says Happy Holidays, um, we need to say Merry Christmas. And, and, I, and I'm not against that. I, I say Merry Christmas everywhere I go. The other day I was on the phone with a customer service person and they ended the conversation with Happy Holidays. And I said, Merry Christmas to you too. Um, but I, I, so I get that we should say that and we should. But I, I have this hunch. And y'all can tell me if you think I'm wrong. I, the hunch is I think Jesus is more concerned that there are millions of people who are hungry. I believe that Jesus is more concerned that there are kids in our community that are cold than whether the clerk at Piggly Wiggly says Happy Holidays or Merry Christmas. I'm not sure that's how we focus on Christ at the center. And the truth is, most of us are going to spend Christmas and we're going to be really no different than most of the secular world. Meaning we're going to spend way too much money. We're going to buy gifts for people who really probably don't need it. We're going to uh, walk around and claim a certain belief and faith, but not necessarily do what Jesus tells us to do. And so I just push you to think about, is that how we're supposed to celebrate Christmas? Is that what we're supposed to do? As the followers of God. Now, Wednesday I was with the Surf House Ministry, and we they were, they were celebrating lunch. And Al, at the very end, Al Jordan said that I liked show and tell, uh, and so um, I brought a show and tell item for you today. Um, who knows what this is? What is it? A wagon wheel. Anybody else got a suggestion? It is not a wagon wheel. It's a loom. Which is? Spinning. Part of the spinning wheel, right? Yes. So this is my grandmother's spinning wheel. Uh, it is, she, she passed away many, many years ago. And so when she passed away, my mother got it. And so it has sat in our, my mother's living room until they had to sell and downsize and all that and so it is I've grown up with this spinning wheel if you can't see in the back I've grown up with the spinning wheel every child in the family every grandchild in the family uh, we all did the very same thing with the spinning wheel it was the we were captains of the ship so we would play in the living room and I would drive the ship and that's what we would use the spinning wheel for uh, when my mother downsized she gave it to us we just don't have room for it so it currently sits in our garage uh, and it uh, props up a tub from falling over. Uh, and so it leans against the tub. Uh, you wouldn't think it weighs that much, but it weighs enough to keep that tub from falling over. And so that's what that does. And I bring it to you because I, I pass it every day as I walk in and out of the garage. And so here's my question is, what do you, what do you think the people 100 years ago who used this for survival, right? I mean, this is what they made their clothes. So what do you think they would think about me using it to prop up a tub? Right? I mean, it just would not make sense to them. Would y'all agree? 
It wouldn't make sense. And so I kind of think about it. So like, what would it be like today? So imagine a year, hundred years from now, people come to church. They're getting ready for Christmas Eve, and they walk in the door, and we have iPhones and laptops that are hanging around everywhere, just hanging down as decoration, right? And so that when they walk in, and that's the Christmas decorations, all these multicolored icons that we use it for decoration. That would make sense to us, correct? But is that how we do with our faith? That our faith, and sometimes in some ways, it's just a, it's just an antique, it sits on the shelf, and maybe we call on it when we need it. So we, we, something bad goes on in our life and we, we pray. That's when we turn to God. Um, but on an everyday basis, it really doesn't have any impact in our life. And I wonder, is that what Jesus came to this earth for? Is that what he died for? Just makes me wonder as I pass by each and every day in my garage. And I'm going to put that here so the point set is going to fall. <laughs> so I just to invite you to think about it. is faith more than simply that? See, I, I think salvation is a mystery, but I think that it's it's directed, the transformation is very simple, which is if you have experienced the life-changing love of God, it should produce in us life-changing action of loving service to other people. Plain and simple. If you have experienced the life-changing love of God, it should produce us in that. Listen to what's, what John says in 1 John chapter 3. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Hear that. I mean, that's harsh. How can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Our love should come at a cost. It should, it should have some skin on it, our love for other people. We tend to pray for God to give us opportunities, but the reality is there's opportunities everywhere you go. I mean, y'all all admitted that you're not going to stay hibernated for the next six days, so somewhere along the way, you're going to meet people. You're going to be able to, to interact with people, and there's going to be opportunities that are going to come your way. It's just whether you will act on them. Instead, what we do is we make excuses. Well, that might make somebody uncomfortable, or that might make me uncomfortable. And then we make excuses not to forgive. We should make excuses why we can rationalize the behaviors that we have. And our faith should make a difference. Our faith is practical. It should change the way that we live every single day. And I would make the argument that if it changes the way that we live, that's how we change the world. That God changes the world through us as he changes our lives. And this isn't profound. It's just, can you imagine what would happen if we actually did it? Can you imagine, church, what it would look like if we actually followed through on what Jesus says? I'm part of the Rotary, and so at the Rotary, uh, the last few, probably about two weeks ago, um, they gave updates, the last one, on the Bob Ryan golf tournament. And Michael, you did a sermon uh, about some of the saints of the church, and, you know, I, I hear his story. I never met Bob, so I hear his story, and... I think about the impact that his life has had on this community, not just the church community, but the, the community of Jackson, his passion and investment for, for young people in the recreation ministry. Um, that's doing something with your life, right? I mean, they're having a passion for something that affects and, 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 and changes other people. And that's what you see. So Wednesday, we were uh, at the lunch for the surf house and as Al made the joke about uh, my show and tell, God showed up in a pretty powerful way, which was uh, God's own show and tell. He brought the waitress over to us, and she said, I just feel like I need to share my testimony with you. And she began to tell us her testimony. And it's her testimony to tell, but, but I want you to hear something this morning. 
is as she shared her testimony, and there were many tears as she did, she was at a low point in her life, and she cried out to God. And it wasn't a sermon that changed her life. It wasn't a great choir. It was somebody who gave her a ride. And then she needed some clothes, and they helped give her some clothes. And then she needed help trying to work on a resume, and so they helped her work on a resume. Everything that she mentioned, all the things that helped kind of help her see God and the power of God in her life were tangible acts of service that somebody did. I can't imagine what would happen if we, the church, began to live that out. And so that's why I brought the, the, um, the Coke box. We have been doing a Coke drive. And I apologize to you if I have let that become lower importance. Because it's not. There's still kids that are cold. And as I thought about this sermon, I thought, you know what? I'm going to bring it up here. And here's what I want you to realize. Um, I counted this morning. There's ten Cokes in that box. Six of them came from somebody outside our church because I was there when they came in. So that means we've given four. And I'm, and I'm, I'm telling you, I'm just as guilty. Claire and I haven't put a code in there. But we will. And so I'm going to leave it here until we see it overflow. And it's not to make us feel guilty. It's to realize that, y'all, this is the tangible action. You're fixing to go through Christmas. You're fixing to go shopping this week. Or maybe after Christmas you're going to go and there's going to be sales that are going on. All this, this is our opportunity to be able to stop and remind ourselves that we, we don't just claim to follow Jesus. We, we say we're going to do what Jesus says to do. And Jesus says when you have people who are cold, when they need clothing, you provide it for them. That's what we're called to do as the people of God. And so it's going to be here to remind us that we are called to have tangible acts of love and service. Now, that's not the only way we mess up. In my opinion, sometimes our commitment to loving God is disconnected from, I mean, our, our commitment to love our neighbor is disconnected from our love of God. So we do tangible acts, but we don't necessarily connect them to loving God. Listen, you have to love God first. And that's what Scripture says. It says this in 1 John this is how we know, this is how we know that we love the children of God. By loving God and carrying out his commands. So we can't just do the physical acts of service. We have to love God and then we carry out the commitment. Listen, I, I thought about this this morning. Um, my whole life now hasn't always been this case. My whole life is a life of service. And if I were serving you, and please don't be offended by this statement, because the same would be true for me. If I were serving you based on you, I'd quit. Everybody would. You'd quit on me if you were serving because of me. Because people are going to let you down. I'm going to let you down. You're going to let me down. We don't serve for the character of the other person. We don't serve because we have decided that they deserve it or they don't deserve it. We love because God loved us. Listen, we forgive because God forgave us. So the first thing we have to do is we have to think about recognizing that we love because God loved us. It's easy, very easy, to have compassion fatigue. I mean, I tell you, okay, do an angel tree. Now you got to do codes. By the way, we take up an offering. And we're doing an extra offering for the staff bonus. And you're like, when's enough enough? And I get that. But then you have to stop and ask the question. What if God said that? When enough is enough. I mess up on a daily basis. And the beautiful thing is, God forgives me. Enough is never enough for God. So we have to base our giving, we have to base our service, we have to base our love on the character and the nature of God. I mean, the reality is, 
our, our giving and our service, it should not be a big deal. It should never be a big deal. Because that's who we are. That's the people of God. Jesus didn't come to this earth to give us one day where we're supposed to be kind to our family. He didn't give us one season where we're supposed to be nice to our neighbor. It's every day. That's how we're supposed to live. In 1 John, as we read this text, I want to read to you a couple of other points because I think he, he, he shows this to us in a couple of different things, in a couple of different ways. He says, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. And so he says, dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And it sounds like that he's saying this is that, that God sent his son to give us an example. And he did. But there's so much more to this. It goes much deeper because listen to what it says. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us. And his love is made complete in us. No one has ever seen God. See, sometimes we can grow up in the church and we can imagine that everybody has already made the decision whether they know God, whether they love God. Folks, I want you to know there are plenty of people in your community, in your subdivisions, they've never seen God. And the scripture says that if we love one another, that his love, what we celebrate on Christmas, his love is made complete in us. That's how we live out the gospel. What God began in Jesus on that first Christmas is made complete through you and I. So we serve not just to follow an example, but we do it because that's who God is. We teach them the character and the nature of God. So last week we were here for the cantata, and uh, I sent out an email on Saturday that we'd had a water main break and we had no heat. And I wasn't sure whether you would show up, but you did, uh, which was amazing. Uh, but I haven't told y'all the story about the water main break. So let me tell you, um, it happened sometime on Friday. Uh, we don't know exactly what time. Uh, I assume that we will find that out when we get our water bill uh, as to how much water went out. But uh, somewhere we had a water main break in the playground and water was going everywhere. Um, about 1 o'clock that morning, Saturday morning, Somebody in this community um, rode past the church. Now, this is not somebody that goes to church here. This is somebody in Jackson. He rode past, and they saw what was going on, and they realized that wasn't right. And so they stopped to see what they could do. They knew somebody who goes to church here, so they called in at 1.40 in the morning and said, Hey, how can I cut your water off? Uh, because you got some, you got a problem up here, and they talked them through it, and they were able to cut our water off. So they got everything stopped, and then they came back up on Saturday and met with somebody in the church to be able to make sure that they knew what all they had done in order to take care of the problem. That's somebody who doesn't go to church here. What does that tell you? I just tell you their story because here's what: what does that tell you about that person's character? Pretty good, right? I mean, like, I don't know the guy, but I would say he's probably a pretty stand-up good guy, uh, that he's willing to, to come by here and do all of that. Um, it teaches us something. So, and, and I tell you that story because think about how we connect that to the love of God. So if we go out through the love of God and we love our neighbors, what does that teach them about the character of God and the nature of This woman that I met on Wednesday, and several of you were in that lunch, you know what I'm saying when I'm doing it. She was at a low point in her life. I can't say she was at the lowest point, but she seemed to indicate it was pretty low. She was at a low point in her life. And she was looking for the power of God in her life. And it was those simple, tangible actions that helped her to know that God he wasn't, he wasn't away from her. He was still working in her life. She saw the power and the presence of God in those simple actions. Can you imagine? Can you imagine?
you imagine what God would do in Butts County and Jackson if we love God and we go and do tangible acts of service? Amen? Let's pray. Most gracious God, we thank you. We thank you, Lord. First and foremost, as we said, we thank you, Lord, for, for loving us. for moving in our hearts. And I'll just say that I'll pray, Lord, that if there's anybody in this room who, who doesn't know you, I pray in this moment that your Holy Spirit moves in their hearts. And that they're able to experience you. If there's some in this room that are distant, Use this time to draw them closer to you. And Lord, help us as a church to hear your word, to see your life, your example, and to go and live it. Help us to realize that by teaching people or showing people these tangible acts of service, that we are literally showing them your character and nature. It's your message. Christ the babe is born for you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
uh, at 10 a.m. and that sometimes can get lost because of the Christmas Eve uh, and so just want to make sure y'all are all prepared for that as well and then we'll do 